Hello and welcome back to 5-Minute Consult. We've discussed the clinical presentation and causes of abdominal bloating and distension to conclude how might these symptoms be treated. This is difficult gastroenterology. For starters, almost all trials addressing bloating and distension have been performed in irritable bowel syndrome where these symptoms were evaluated as secondary rather than primary endpoints. In addition, trials have not recognised the difference between bloating, which describes the sensation of abdominal pressure, and distension that describes measurable increase in abdominal girth. These symptoms are lumped together, although they reflect different pathophysiologies. There are also no national or international consensus treatment guidelines to draw on, and we can only extrapolate from studies of irritable bowel syndrome. IBS trials that have addressed bloating and distension have included dietary interventions, surfactants, anti-foaming agents, antispasmodics, bulking agents, osmotic laxatives, prokinetics, tricyclics, SSRIs, 5-hydroxytryptamine agonists and antagonists, prebiotics and antibiotics, and no clear winners have emerged. To further muddy the waters, it is likely that many negative trials have been excluded from the literature and the evidence we have to work with is likely to be heavily influenced by publication bias. With all this confusion and the absence of good evidence, I will outline a personal approach that could help you evolve your own treatment strategy. Current best evidence suggests that the symptoms are not caused by increased intestinal gas volumes. There is, however, evidence of impaired gas transit and, in IBS, failure of an autonomic reflex where rectal distension fails to accelerate gas transit. Perhaps most important is observation that bloaters tend to demonstrate exaggerated visceral sensation while distenders have reduced gut sensitivity. So, an initial step might be to determine whether bloating or distension is the dominant symptom and to engage treatment strategies that correct these abnormal gut sensations. This, or for that matter any other approach to treatment, needs to recognise that patients often hold strong beliefs about the role of diet, in particular gluten and sugars. Others are concerned about intestinal infections with bacteria, candida or even parasites. Whilst patients without preconceived ideas might comply with a physiological explanation leading to a treatment plan, those with more fixed beliefs might require some collusion. More about that in a moment. Treating bloating and distension is one of the great challenges facing GPs and specialists. At the outset, patients need to absorb a narrative that illuminates some of the mystery and there needs to be sufficient clinic time to explain. They should be acquainted with bowel anatomy, understand the origins of intestinal gas and appreciate the evidence that the symptom reflects the state of bowel sensitivity rather than the accumulation of excessive gas volume. To explain the idea of bowel sensitivity, you might use the analogy of stereo speakers and volume control. We all have a sweet spot where the listening volume is both comfortable and pleasant. However, there is a threshold on either side where an increase or decrease in volume causes discomfort. You might explain to patients that in some individuals, bowel wall sensation is inappropriately amplified in the brain, resulting in a sensation of bloating and pressure, whilst in others the bowel sensory output is turned down and these patients experience the dominant symptom of abdominal distension and increased girth. One stereo speaker might broadcast an abnormally loud sound, whilst the other, an abnormally soft sound, and by analogy, some patients experience both bloating and distension. Better comprehension of the disorder and reassurance is the backbone of treatment. I've already mentioned that some patients hold strong beliefs about the origin of their symptoms, and it's often helpful to collude rather than argue. For example, if the patient is convinced that food is a trigger, then dietary manipulation could be a good starting point. Some patients might have already experimented with a gluten or sugar-free diet, and if effective, this might be endorsed, even in the absence of celiac disease or sugar intolerance. The FODMAP diet has been popularised in the management of IBS, and for those patients keen on a low-fermentation dietary approach, this might be endorsed as a good starting point. Similarly, when patients are concerned about bowel infection, 
it might be prudent to work with this belief rather than taking an adversarial position. In IBS, non-absorbable antibiotics include neomycin and rifaximin have been used with some patients reporting benefit. However, treatment with long-term antibiotics is not a realistic proposition. My approach is to recommend a probiotic strategy, suggesting that a change in the colonic microbiome might address concerns about foreign infections. In IBS, probiotics trials have reported variable outcomes, but this approach is certainly worth a trial. There is a placebo-controlled study indicating that a twice-daily pot of probiotic yoghurt containing Bifidobacterium lactis taken for four weeks resulted in objective reduction of distension and improved IBS symptoms. So a month's trial of twice-daily yoghurt or perhaps as an off-the-shelf probiotic might be a starting point. For patients without a strong belief system, it might be useful to explain that increased bowel sensitivity causing bloating is best managed by reducing pressure on the bowel wall and or using drugs that reduce visceral sensitivity. Reduced bowel wall pressure might be achieved by dietary manipulation designed to reduce fermentation. The FODMAP diet excludes fermentable dietary substrates. The acronym stands for fermentable oligo di monosaccharides and polyols and introduction and compliance requires a highly motivated patient working with a skilled dietitian. Heightened visceral sensitivity might also be reduced by the tricyclics amitriptyline or nortriptyline prescribed at low dose of between 10 and 25 milligrams taken at night. Where distension is the dominant symptom, probably caused by reduced visceral sensation and increased bowel wall relaxation, low fermentation diets and or probiotics might reduce intestinal gas volumes to below normal and this might register as a reduction in abdominal distension. Finally, it's worth remembering that gut-directed hypnosis can be employed as a powerful intervention to address increased or decreased visceral perception and where this is available, hypnosis can be added to the treatment regimen. The treatment of functional abdominal bloating and distension requires considerable counselling skill and time. In general, the art of managing these symptoms overlaps with the management of IBS, where altered bowel habit is an additional component. In summary, it's useful for both clinicians and patients to recognise the concepts of increased and decreased visceral sensitivity. It's also helpful to engage positively with the patient's beliefs. Whilst there seems to be logical pathway for dominant bloating or distension, the symptoms often overlap and for most patients, treatment requires a systematic and tailored sequence of interventions that might include dietary manipulation designed to reduce colonic fermentation, attempts to alter the colonic microbiome with pre- and probiotics, and strategies to redress abnormal visceral sensitivity and awareness using tricyclic therapy and gut-directed hypnosis. That concludes the five-minute consult series on abdominal bloating and distension. Hope you enjoyed learning. Remember, there's an audio-only edition as well as a script PDF for each of the three consults.